welcome to Barnyard Language. We are Katie and Arlene, an Iowa sheep farmer and an Ontario dairy farmer with six kids, two husbands, and a whole lot of chaos between us. So kick off your boots, reheat your coffee, and join us for some Barnyard Language, honest talk about running farms and raising families. In case your kids haven't already learned all the swears from being in the barn, it might be a good idea to put on some headphones or turn down the volume. While many of our guests are professionals, they aren't your professionals. If you need personalized advice, consult your people. Welcome to another episode of Barnyard Language. Thank you very much for joining us here on the podcast again today. So, Katie, last time we talked, I think harvest was just about done or maybe done done. What is going on the farm now? This is when you just take a vacation, right, for several months. Yeah, I have a text message here that the last of the corn is at 19.2%, which I assume means that we're going to finish combining ASAP. The vet is here right now working steers and the bull through the chute, which is why I'm in here recording podcasts. Go us. Go scheduling. Way to schedule, Arlene. Thank you. Vets for, coming for, again next the Tuesday, who, if you could book us then, too. Yeah, we'll schedule an interview for that day. That'd be great. I just want to mention, for people who are not watching the video on Patreon, when Katie's voice cuts in and out, it's because she's looking out the window, because she needs to visually see what's happening on the farm when she talks about it, which I love. <laughs> I'm going to move my mic to the other side of my desk, currently. <laughs> so you can but, just look out the window I was... when I ask you what's going on the farm. Yes, it is ridiculous that I do have to look out the window. I've also noticed there is a window in our stairwell. And every morning when I get up, I look out the window. And every night when I go to bed, I look out the window just to make sure that there is nothing untoward happening. I Just like, on that ang- particular it, angle of the farm. yeah. Yes, it is a compulsion. I've tried not doing it. It doesn't like I will have to go back to the landing and look. But I, from there, I can see the barn and the sheep shed. So basically, if I can't see it from there, it probably doesn't matter. Yeah, that's all the important uh, stuff. Other than that, I started Christmas shopping this week. Well, I did not buy my daughter the $40 purse that looks like a taxidermied unicorn. Sorry, baby. It's not going to happen. Anyway, Arlene, what's happening on your farm? I think I need you to send me a picture of this thing because Because that is an interesting description. I'll post a photo to the social medias, but the girl child asked for a purse that has eyeballs that move and blink. And it looks like it is legitimately made of a taxidermy meat animal. If you want one, they have them at Target. I think they have two different sizes, but they were like 40 some dollars. Uh, but it's not coming into your house. No. Totally a horror movie waiting to happen. I have definitely not started Christmas shopping, but one of the issues in our house is that we have three birthdays between now and Christmas, three of my four children. So there's a few things that have to happen <laughs> between now and Christmas that mean that I have a hard time focusing on anything until a couple weeks before but we'll it'll happen we'll get there farm life this week was is the row winter fair in toronto the teen the oldest is there showing her jersey heifer and this will be their goodbye as well because i think i mentioned earlier in the season that she borrowed a 4-h calf this year from another farm And so she'll be showing her heifer and then it's going to go back home and not back here with her. So I expect there might be some tears over that situation. So they'll be saying goodbye. And also my husband and several of our employees who are both 4-H members and co-leaders with my husband of the dairy club are all there. So I'm here on the farm and I actually recruited my own mom to come and help milk cows with me because there was nobody left. So it's been an interesting couple of days. We've done pretty well and I'm not used to being in charge. So that's an adjustment for me, but we're making it happen. I've got lots of checklists to make sure that I don't forget anything. And I think that I should knock on wood right now because we've got one milking left and then my husband will be back for morning milking. So I guess we'll find out whether we did everything right or not, but we've had two calves born and they're both doing fine. Moms are doing fine so far. So yeah, so far so good. How tempted have you been to text Hugh and make something up just to fuck with him? Not at all. Maybe I'm. Well, I know which of us is a terrible person and which of us is not. Okay, thanks, Arlene. I guess my thought is he's looking after a whole bunch of teenagers as a four H chaperone right now, so maybe I don't want to stress him out with stuff that's not happening here while he's also got a lot going on there, and he's trucking all. 
trucking everybody's heifers back home too with our truck and trailer. So we'll, we just don't want them to rush. Even if something really bad went wrong, that but it hasn't, we'll, we can just hold off until he gets closer. That's totally valid. And I think that's the main update. Yeah, manure got out on all the fields. We did get a call from the road commissioner, as usual, to let us know that there was mud on the road, which we knew, and that we should go and scrape it off. So yeah, we did our best using large equipment and going out into fields. Sometimes a little mud gets on the road. So I suspect it's the same person who always complains when we spread manure that, that called the township again. But yeah, it wasn't the police. So that's progress. I suppose that we should feel very blessed on this person's behalf that they have nothing bigger to concern themselves with than, yeah, we'll go with quote that. unquote, mud on the yes. road. Yeah, muddy tires. I'm sorry. Yeah, well done. All right, let's introduce our guest for this week. All right. Today, we're talking to Billy J. Miller, an author, photographer, and speaker from Alberta, Canada. Her new book is called Farm Kids, Stories from Our Lives. So we knew that she was our kind of person and that we had to have her on the podcast. Billy, we start each of our interviews with the same question. This is a way to introduce yourself to our listeners. And we ask, what are you growing? So this can cover crops and livestock, families, businesses, all kinds of things. Billy, what are you growing? What are we growing? We are growing canola, flax, wheat, oats, and barley on our eastern Alberta mixed grain farm, mixed cattle and grain farm. We also have some cows. We're also growing two young ladies named Madeline and Kate, ages 10 and 8. We're raising a Bernese mountain dog and any number of farm cats. It's a good combination of things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to interject. I got to meet my first burner last week and it was amazing. Best oh, yeah. dog ever. So oh, yeah. fluffy. Yeah. Such big feet and so fluffy. Huge feet. We had a contractor here working in our yard the other day and he's, I've never seen bigger feet on a dog before. It's just, yeah, they have such soft parts and such big bodies. That's awesome. Yeah, this dog was really convinced that he was a lap dog, and he's apparently oh. well on to 200 pounds, and he was just really ready oh. to climb right up and sit on me. I'm like, I'll let you. I'm, it's fine by me, but yeah. his owner said they tried to discourage that sort of thing in the yeah. interest of not killing anyone. All right, now we can actually get back to the interview. Okay. The pup talk segment of our show. So in the more farm specific questions, what kind of cows are we talking about? Everyone always wants to know the, uh, the lineage of the livestock. Yeah, of course. And I'm always the best farm wife in the world. When I say that's my hubby's, my hubby's the big cow guy we've got. And I always say, yeah, we've got some black ones. We've got some tan ones. We've got some brown ones. We've got some red ones. <laughs> are you eating them or milking them? We have a cow calf operation. Okay. But, yeah. see, that really yeah. narrows it down if you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, you got gotcha. Yeah, so, no dairy here. All right. So what is your background like when it comes to agriculture? Did you grow up on a farm or is this kind of a, yeah. a new thing for you? It's it, it wasn't completely foreign, but I really didn't grow up on a farm. I was raised, I always tell people I came from the most opposite background as my husband did. My husband is from a fourth generation. He's a fourth generation farmer. We live on his original homestead. We, uh, he's got all the history and the deep roots that I always wished I had and that I never had, to be honest. I come from a completely opposite background that had a mixed cast of characters. I moved around a lot, not to get too serious, too deep into the interview, but <clears throat> divorced background, divorced family. My mother's on her fourth marriage. We have a very challenged relationship and it's, yeah, to be honest, my husband and this farm and this life has offered me the life that I've always could have imagined, put it that way. So, yeah. I, I'm in a lot the same place, Billy. I moved, I think, 38 times before I met my husband. Wow. I was 32 wow. when we got married and he has lived on the same property literally his entire life. And he's also a fourth generation on this property. So Isn't that interesting? In a lot yeah, of the same I spot. Dean and I were 34. So I understand. Yeah. Like definitely not the younger couple. Mm -hmm. 34 when we met, I was 36 when I had my first girl, 38 when I had my second girl. 
And uh, yeah, being able to offer them this, the deep roots in history is pretty awesome too. Having said that though, like just to go deeper into that, I did grow up in usually a smaller town. So I live, I lived up until grade eight in a small Saskatchewan town. We did at one point, like for certain periods of my life, we did actually rent on a dairy farm in Saskatchewan. So that's what I meant when I said I wasn't completely foreign to farming. I was around it. And definitely loved that experience of being renters on this dairy farm in Saskatchewan. And then I did grow up and wait from Lloydminster, which is the nearest town we live now. But then it was after high school, I had immediately moved away. I did a stint in Europe. I went to Germany when I was 18 for about six months and did some traveling there and learning the language and kind of immersing myself in the culture. And then my life took me to Calgary where I started university and began working in the private sector. I lived there and worked there for 10 years. And then I moved on to Edmonton and lived there for six, working for the provincial government, which is when I met Dean. And if you heard in that part of the story, I did live in Calgary longer. So yes, I am a Flames fan. As Canadians, we need to declare our no. hockey allegiances at, I mean, at a certain point. Especially given this round of playoffs. Yes, I am definitely allegiant to the Flames. Yes. <laughs> I got so, it. Arlene, you live in a family home as well, right? Yes. Me. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I was asking Arlene if she lived in a family home as well. This is totally off script, but whatever. Did either of you experience a sense of disappointment or grief at not getting a, not picking out the home that you live in and not having a That's choice about it? It was shocking to me to realize how emotional I got about not getting a choice in where we live. That is so interesting. Arlene, you could start if you want, and then I can. So I know, but at the same time, I grew up on a farm and in the same house my entire life. My dad was a, my dad was a dairy farmer. My parents were dairy farmers. So while both of you had that situation of moving a lot, I was in a situation where I never had to worry about it. There were other kids who would move in and out and be the new kid in the class. And I knew that we weren't going anywhere. We were where the cows were and this is where we were going to stay. And when my husband's grandmother decided to move out of the house that we currently live in, we did a full renovation at that time because this house had been continually lived in by the same family, generations of the same family, since it was built in the 18. 18- 60s so while there had been lots of little additions and renovations there were none of those modern conveniences like insulation there was no ductwork the electrical like as soon as the electrician came in he ripped the whole electrical system out and started from scratch because things had just been added over time so we actually were living in another house while this house got renovated so i did get to pick a lot of features We tore the house apart and then put it back almost exactly the same way it was, but I also loved it the way it was and the historical elements. So for me, I didn't have that, but that's not to say that's everyone's situation. What about you, Billy? It's interesting. You, I've never been asked that before. And there was a little bit of that. Definitely. Not that in any way I was disappointed with this place, but with the feeling that it didn't feel mine for a long time. It took a long time before that happened. And I know a lot of people resonate with that in farm life if you move on to a property, right? And we don't share this property. So the property is just, we are the only ones that live here. My husband had already built a shop here, all of that kind of stuff. But it took until, so the house that we live in is a 1960, mid 60s. It was like the second house that his grandparents had built, actually third possibly. Anyway, I think it's the third house that had been on this property, but- you know how that goes over years. So it was built in the 60s and it was literally like picked out from the Eaton's catalog as it used to be back in the day. It was that rectangle house that exists all over the prairies. And so we had lived here for 10 years. We got married in 2010, our two kids. We had lived here for 10 years before we were able to do the full renovation. Obviously there was land and legal ownership, all that kind of stuff that had to happen beforehand. And then we ended up renovating and moving back in two years ago. So it wasn't until really that we had done a full renovation based on our own design 
to this house to make it our forever home, but it started feeling like mine. Having the mortgage on it, it all also obviously helps. Yeah, when you're paying, paying for, for it. that mortgage. <laughs> yeah. It's, there was a little bit of that. Not that I wanted to move, Caitlin, but it was because, yeah, like it wasn't necessarily our choice. And you always, especially if you did move around a lot, and I don't have a home or even quite frankly, the family to go back to growing up like so many other people do. So there was a little bit of that feeling, I guess, longing or missing the opportunity to be able to like house search, look for that dream home for yourself or whatever. But having said that, getting through the story like we have and being where we are now, I cannot picture my life being anywhere else. And I have such a love for this place, this yard. The fact that my kids walk to school. I watch them nearly every morning and I'm waiting for them when they get off the bus, when they walk up and down this beautiful tree-lined laneway. And these spruce trees are absolutely huge and so tall. And my kids' granddad planted those trees with his mom and his aunties. And it's like you sit there and I always feel like I see my life or see life in pictures, right? Because I take photos. But it's imagine those trees getting continuously growing and my kids are continuously growing beside them. Yeah, having said that, I'm super happy with where we're at now. Now I'm just going to feel bad, Billy, because I actually, I do love our house. I really do. But one oh. of my things is that I was raised, my mom is a historian by training. And so I learned to really value that and to really value family histories and that sort of thing. And that's actually a lot of where I learned to enjoy talking to people is she worked for the State Historical Society interviewing folks. Oh. And so I would go along and sit at these old farmhouse kitchen tables and eat homemade cookies and listen to old folks talk. And I was raised to really value that. But now when I'm like, there's this tree in the yard, who the actual fuck planted this tree here? Why is this here? And I'll ask and I'll be like, can we just cut this tree down? And my husband, will, no joke. My husband and his grandpa brought some trees back from a fishing trip to Canada or some damn, I don't know. But now there is this tree in the most ridiculous place that can never be taken down. And it is the ugliest thing. And no one can ever touch it because it's the <laughs> because of the history tree. <laughs> and I'm like, and I do deeply appreciate the histories I hear about this house. Uh, and yeah. I, I love our yeah. house, despite things like yeah. the fire marshal came in after we got electrical work done and said, you've never had a fire. And I said, not that I know of. And he looked at me and he said, are you sure? I'm like, oh, wow. Please don't say that. <laughs> yeah. Don't say that. But then there's things that you just, you can't change stuff because yeah. that's how it's always yeah. been. And yeah, and I know. Yeah. For us as well, I hear people say, but you're so lucky because you don't have a mortgage. And I'm like, A, we are paying for the farm. And B, we're still paying for it. It's not yeah. just because we don't write a check to the bank doesn't mean that somebody is just handing us this. Yes. Here you go. No, it just means that the bank isn't getting the money. And that's, and it works well for us. And I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity. But yeah, as someone who's used to having a lot more flexibility and freedom, this moving into one house and then being moved right. into the farmhouse and then knowing that hopefully we'll get old and our kids will take over and we'll move into the house where my in-laws live now. Yeah. Is a little, a yeah. little much. No, I absolutely get that. And you can't move that damn tree. <laughs> and it's this fucking tree that I'm like, I don't want to be that person who's like, I hope this tree is hit by lightning. It's 15 feet from our house. Like I, but. Oh but if it were hit by lightning and didn't do any other damage, then that would yeah. be right. Worse than that would be all right. Yeah. Watch now this tree is going to get hit by lightning. And my husband's <laughs> going to be like, if you hadn't talked about this. Sorry, dear. So Katie was talking about her history with interviewing people. And two of the books that you already have out, Billy, are about farm wives. So I'm farm wives. So I'm assuming that took a lot of interviewing. What brought you to that project and, and brought those books into yeah. existence? So my first book, <clears throat> Farm Wives and Profile, 17 Women, 17 Candid Questions About Their Lives 
photos and recipes was my first project coming here. As I said, I had lived in Edmonton working for the provincial government when I met my husband. Okay, so from when we met, from the weekend that we met on a fishing trip in northern Saskatchewan, me living here and us being married was uh, happened over the span of 14 months. So it was pretty quick transition. Yeah. But when I came here, I had been looking, obviously, I didn't want to give up my government job or government experience, all of that. So I was looking for any government position in Lloydminster to Vermilion, which is where we live. So we are basically just explain where we are as well. We're two and a half hours directly east of Edmonton. So we reside very close to the Saskatchewan border. And we're about 25 kilometers from the Saskatchewan border. And, but we are on the Alberta side. And so there are two ta- two si- smaller cities that we live in between and south of. And uh, they take about 35 minutes to travel to each. And so I could have been looking for a job in either of those cities. So I landed the only provincial position that was available in Vermilion. And I took that and it was a job at the courthouse and it was a really big pay cut, but at least it kept me in government. And so I took the job. And that, like I said, that got me here. And remind me of your question again, so I know I'm not going too off. <laughs> well, I was just asking you about how your farm wise yes. books came to be. Exactly. So we had a child. We had my first child in November of 2011. So taking my maternity leave from that government job, I had this idea when I got here. And like after we got married, And getting to know this community so well, and in particular, getting to know the women so well, like my mother-in-law, the women around her, seeing all these women around here, kind of the way I picture it was I started becoming so intimately involved in these farms and these families and this community, right? And you see all these farms and all this activity and all this work going on, buzzing around, scurrying around. But the thing that I really saw were these women. And I saw these women scurrying around and working so hard. And I felt holding these farms up on their backs. And I saw these women, they had, we have this beautiful old prairie hall down the road from our place called the Early Hall. We live in the Early District, which is a really storied and wonderful district in this area of the prairies that I am so lucky to live. And they had a wedding shower for Dean and I there and all and it was like everyone knew what to do right like they announced the date of the shower and all of the women showed up and the ladies brought baking and all of the women come and men came to the shower too actually which is really neat and everybody came and the men sat on one side and the women sat on the other side and everybody visited and everybody but it was like the women did all the work for that right and in harvest, my first harvest, I just remember watching my mother-in-law in awe going, oh my gosh, this woman is just a no complaining. You know, you just haul those meals, get them into the back of the car, you drive to the field, you, these women amazed me. And I looked at them with awe and reverence. And I just thought, well, they're absolute, to me, they were the heroes of the story. And I really felt, so when I was on my maternity leave, I had begun, the idea had ruminated for this book. <clears throat> and so A little bit later on, I had long story short, decided not to go back to my job. And I started freelance writing on the side. So I started writing some smaller stories for the community newspaper and things like that. And photography was always a love and passion of mine as well. So in 2012, I had started officially my job as a freelance writer and taking photographs of farm families and things like that. And so these were the stories that had just started coming to me. And so I knew as a dream, I wanted to write a book. I'd always wanted to write a book, but I had this idea for this book. And I was like, I'm going to write about the women. I want to tell their stories. I want to sit down at their kitchen tables and start interviewing them. I wanted to ask them story questions. I had entering this new life as a farm wife for me too. I knew for me, it wasn't necessarily going to be the same. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to fill those roles as a traditional farm wife like so many of the rest of them did, but I wanted to talk to them and I wanted to get their stories. And so that's what I did. I interviewed 17 women. It took four and a half years, mind you, this was not a very quick process. I had a daughter <laughs> and we were running a farm myself, ourselves and, and it was busy just like everyone else's. And so 
17 women. I sat them down. I asked them all questions like, what was the best part of this life as a farm wife for you? What was the hardest part of this life as a farm wife for you? What advice would you give women marrying farmers today? Is there anything you wish you could have changed? Is there so many questions that I just wanted to know the answers to? But then I also got to pair it with wonderful photographs of them doing what they loved or sitting at their kitchen table or just wherever it was we happened to have met and handwritten recipes because who doesn't love a recipe book? And I think that was another beautiful part of it. The best project or the best piece of it for me too was I was getting to the completion part of this book and I knew I loved it. I was really proud of how it was looking, but there was something missing for me. And I just wanted to be able to do something really special for these women. And so I had reached out to those of them who I was able to contact their families, their children. And I had reached out to them and I said, tell me about the impact your mother has had on your life. And so a lot of these children who I was able to reach ended up writing, submitting a written piece for me, answering that question and the impact their mom has had on their life. And to me, that was the most meaningful piece of the project for me because these as you guys probably are well aware these aren't necessarily families or a job where the farm wife or the mom is sat down frequently told thank you for all that you do and where they're as appreciated as I felt they could have and should have been and so being able to offer that was yeah definitely a big thing for me very meaningful did you find that the people their families and their spouses reading the book were finding out things that they didn't know about these women? About the oh, absolutely. Were, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It was really nice. Oh, so this community that I live, we're not the only ones that have been here for a hundred years. There are obviously lots of other people as well. And being able to talk to like their grandkids or is means a lot it means a lot to a lot of the people here that their grandmother or mother was in that book. And yeah. A lot of them, they didn't sit down and ask their grandma those kinds of questions. Yeah, it was. I think it was really nice for a lot of people to be able to read that side of the women that not all of us knew. And then your second book, it was on a the same topic. Was it yeah. a continuation of the first, or what did what does it look like? It was so the first book. All the women were between fifty five and ninety, and so they all fit the traditional role of a farm wife. I would say. And these are the women that I was drawn to when I first came here. These are the women that were surrounding me. And uh, these are the women that I felt a heart connection to because, and I'll, and I'll be honest, I know serendipitously, it, it, I respected and loved in these women exactly that which I didn't have. They were the glue holding their families together. They were, they did everything for their families. And I came from a very opposite story of that. So I know that's what I was so drawn to and so connected to. The second book, though, was it's called Farm Wives 2, an inspiring look of the of the new Canadian farm wives. And so what I wanted to do was attach those some of those same questions, but also to a bunch of new questions to the next generations of farm wives. So women like me. Women from their 20s up to their anywhere in their 50s. Women who are more generations removed from the farm, but who are coming onto their farm from a variety of circumstances. Some who did refer to themselves as a farm wife and some who didn't refer to themselves as a farm wife, to be honest. But they all agreed to be in the book, <laughs> knowing the title. And I wanted to talk to them about what that looked like for them. I knew there was other women like me. I knew there was other women very different from me, but women who were doing things their own way. And I felt like they deserved a voice. And I also felt like I wanted to have kind of a resource or something. I wanted to put a book out there in existence where other women could look at that and be like, wow, that's a great story. I could do something like that. Or that makes me realize that there's nothing wrong with the way I'm doing things or like... There are a lot of stories out there and there are a lot of complex stories out there. Caitlin, you were talking about your story about living in the house or landing on a lot of people share yards. A lot of people move into house. There are just such a variety of circumstances out there. And I think sometimes when you like me and when you don't come from the farming background, I think a lot of women are questions or have concerns or just I guess don't necessarily know where to go or you feel like you have to do things in a certain way don't you I think a lot of times and yeah that was a big part of the reasoning of putting this book out into the world I know 
too, I find it interesting, you know, the older I get and the older my kids get because I'm 41. So I'm also a net slightly older mom because my kids are four and five. So for this area, I'm closer to grandma age than to mom age. No, seriously. There's the older I get, the more I understand my grandmothers, especially. And that there's so much about women didn't used to do X, Y, and Z. And because they couldn't, it wasn't that they never wanted to. It was that they couldn't. And the stories I hear about this whole generation of women that during the war went off and had these fairly grand adventures and then came home, got married, got knocked up, and never said anything about it again. And how amazing it is that now we have this opportunity to do things like telling our stories and publishing books and going on adventures and But at the same time, wanting to do things like this podcast and have the opportunity to tell our stories about all these things that women in non-rural backgrounds might not understand on the same level. Like I know for a lot of folks, if I say my in-laws live across the road and there's this look of horror, which I do understand because some people have really shitty in-laws. I am very lucky that I have great in-laws, but it's hard to have that conversation with folks who are living in a time and place where having your in-laws a couple hundred feet away would be considered strange. So this getting to have adventures, but also getting to just come back and do the same things. And I was not ignoring you when I hopped up. I was looking for a book by Evelyn Berkby, who wrote a weekly column for 70 years for a Iowa small town newspaper and had always put a recipe in it. I was going to send you the info, but amazing. yeah. Yeah. Just these, how many of these new things we're doing are not new at all. And she did a radio show for most of those 70 years as well. So it's basically podcasting before it was cool. That's Um, right. Yeah. So Billy, we'd love to know more too about your newest book project, Farm Kids. And can you tell us about that book and what it looks like and who you talk to for that? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I'm self-publishing this book, just like I fully self-published my last book, which was a little kid's book I wrote at the start of COVID with my daughters. And I had actually taken a course that walked you through the literal steps from start to finish of getting your book out and doing it entirely on your own. And self-publishing works best for me for the kind of interviews that I do. I've never traditionally published. If you do, it could take absolute years before you get your book out. And because a lot of the people in my books are in their 90s, or in the case of this Farm Kids book, I have a 100-year-old woman in this book. I want to get this book out in their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So I self-publish, and that is the way that I learned to do it and I just do it and anyway so yeah but anyway this book I have 27 new people in this book and so farm kids stories from our lives is different in the sense that it includes boys too this time and so I've interviewed girls and boys men and women from the age of five all the way up to 100 and it isn't just current farm kids granted that would be one hilarious book and it would be so fabulous but I love speaking with seniors I just do I just spent an hour yesterday doing a big application form for uh, our health region I just decided I need to volunteer in the hospitals I just want to I could sit with old people all day long and just let them tell me stories about so I know that's a big part of this book and as I said, I interviewed 24, 27 people. These are kids all just pick, people picked that I know that were referred to me. Some of the kids go to school with my kids. One woman is my husband's grandmother, but it's just a variety of people. And I also reached back out to families from my Farm Kids 2 book as well. Talked to grandkids of their or kids of theirs. But anyway, I talked to them and asked them all different kinds of questions about what is life like being raised a farm kid, whether that be now or whether that be in the 1920s, because what a cool way to look at the, what a cool frame of reference and what a cool 
way to compare what are some of the troubles we deal with now versus what are some of the troubles you had what did a typical day after school look like in 1933 versus what it looks like now i think one thing i've learned is any single person that i have spoken to about who has raised a farm kid all loved it not one person i'm not saying people don't have some bad memories too of course you will but any, anyone I've spoken to now from adulthood is there's no other, no better way to be raised. I have the best memories. I've got the things we used to do, the things we got to learn. They just talk about all of this stuff with reverence. And I feel like that is such a nice way to, I just, I want to be able to capture that and express that life for people who either A, if you were raised that way, these stories will all encompass those good memories that you'll all think of yourself but I it's going to be a really nice way to t show people this life who don't necessarily know because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about urban versus rural I think there's a lot of people don't know necessarily where your food comes from people don't know you hear so many things this touches into a bigger aspect of it but you hear so much information out there misinformation about food about beef about farm life and all of that and people don't necessarily know the truth people don't necessarily know I hear you hear so many things about factory farm, farming's bad big farming's bad all this kind of stuff people don't realize what the high percentage of people farms are farm families in this country a lot in the states as well but <clears throat> farms are made up of people farms are made up of families and I think there's nowhere truer than that than in our country and I just look forward to telling those stories. I look forward to reading it. Do you, can you share one of your favorites or is it all under lock and key at this point? It's not under all lock and key. I've been, I have some snippets that I publish on my blog. You can, my website, I just want to share is billyjmiller.com. And if you go on there, you'll find all the information for all of my books and what I'm working on currently and stuff like that. I think my favorite in my heart has to be like these younger kids interviews now. They talk with such, one of the beauty aspects of it is you ask, when you ask someone who are in, who's in their 90s, the perspective of what are your best memories of your mom? What are the key memories you have at the stage of your life of your dad? That's so meaningful for me because I felt like to be able to, once you get to that stage of your life, and none of us know what that stage is going to be like yet. Once you get to that stage of your life, I fit, the way I picture it is it comes to a bottle where the bottle nears or narrows at the top. And I feel like only the most important stuff remains at that stage. So when you're a hundred, <clears throat> what do you still think of when you think of your mom? What are the memories that stick with you the most? What are the feelings that stick with you the most? And when you think of your dad, that's the kind of stuff that I thought about as I was interviewing these people. To interview like a six-year-old now <clears throat> and ask them that question, you get very different answers. Like this little guy, Max Merrill, <laughs> he goes to my daughter's school. And I'm like, tell me the coolest thing about your mom. And I know his mom, Sheena, quite well. And Max says... Oh yeah. Oh, my mom goes to town. She gets a lot of groceries. <laughs> oh, Yay, mom. She Good carries job, so mom. many bags in from the car. And then there were these two little guys, Charlie and Benny Ketty. They're from Nova Scotia. And that was the other thing. I've interviewed people like, for farm wives too, was the same I branched out and interviewed people from across the country for that book. The first farm wives book was very centered to my community because these were the women that I knew and that I had the opportunity to sit down and meet with farm wives too. I expand because I wanted to tell the story a little more Canada wide and farm kids stories from our lives is the same. I branched out a little more and I spoke to actually this woman's children <clears throat> and they're from Nova Scotia and they have a totally farm strawberries out there and different things that we just don't do as much of over here. Right. In Alberta. So it was just fabulous. And I talked to those two little boys and of course you're doing this via zoom, right. And via written interview, because I certainly didn't have the funding being self published and all to jet set all across the country. But these two little boys, I talked to them about their life. What, when they run the farm, when they get older, it's just fabulous, right? Like you just see things through the eyes of a child and all of them 
also, can I think if you notice that with your own kids or whatever, when you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, it almost always includes a farmer, doesn't it? Granted, it's their frame of reference, but they have all these wild and amazing views of what they want to do. And it always includes the farm. And uh, yeah, so, you know, this little Max Merrill, and there was another three little girls that I interviewed. There's this, and this is thanks to the wonder of social media. There's a gentleman on Twitter I had come across years ago and started following him. And he's a dairy farmer from Washington state. His name's Dwayne Faber. And he is hilarious. Like he just, he would publish these one-liners about farm life. He's got a beautiful wife, three beautiful daughters, like just this adorable family. And he just talks about being a dad and a husband and uh, a dairy farmer, right? And he talks about this. And so I had followed him for years and I ended up reaching out to him. And yeah, typically these are Canadian stories, but I'm like, I'm not going to judge here. So I asked him, I said, would your daughters be interested in doing this interview? Because I think coming from you, they have to be hilarious as well. And this is my project and this is what it's about. And he said, absolutely. So he had actually mailed me handwritten interviews from his girls too talking about life on their farm and it's just fabulous. So I think the story is amazing in the sense that it, that juxtaposition of you read the wisdom of a hundred year old and then it's peppered with a, all these deep long interviews peppered with these hilarious interviews. And yeah, it's a project I'm so proud of and I can't wait to get it out. And I plan to have it out in time for your summer read here. So yeah, it's coming. That sounds so, awesome. So Billy, how do you deal with getting people past feeling like they don't have a story to tell or like they're going to sound uh, stupid or whatever? You know what? Everybody has I, something to say. Yeah, I know. It's true, isn't it? And that's something I talk about when I do speeches about in particular and talk about my first book. That was the thing that kind of gobsmacked me personally the most was how the sheer amount of women who said to me, as I sat them down for my first book, the amount of women who said to me, I don't understand why you want to talk to me. I haven't done anything. I'm just a farm wife. And I looked at the, and I would just, my mouth would drop because I'm like, you haven't done anything. Have you seen what everything that you do? And I think how I got them over it was I published a book about them. And I will often talk about the book launch night of my first book. And it could still put me into tears thinking about it. I couldn't have imagined a better book launch experience for any book, let alone my first book. But I had rented a restaurant, a beautiful locally run restaurant that was called The Root in Lloydminster. This was in 2016 in January. <laughs> and I had rented it out and I thought there was just enough people if I invite the women, their spouses, and they could invite one other guest, basically. And then that would be the capacity for this beautiful homey, quaint restaurant big but not too big and just perfect so that is who we invited and that is who came but also with the addition of some local media that had come which I was so touched about as well because here was this book that I wrote that I literally thought would be sitting at our local I traditionally or I self-publish however saying that I do get them on all official platforms so they're still on Amazon and chapters and all of that stuff but so literally this first book, you have no idea how it's going to go. I thought I'd be at our grocery store and our local home hardware and I'd sell it to the grandkids and giddy up. I was happy. A yeah, few issues at the library. Yeah, a few copies at the library. I was all excited. And so I had this book launch and all these women came and it was evening and that whether it was and the lighting was lower and it was just I had a book sitting on the table for all of these women and a glass of wine waiting for them and stuff. And these women walked in and I, I kind of don't know if they realized until that night what this pro like, I remember one of the women, so they all wrote the interviews and, I, and there are minimal edits in those books as well, because I'm not going to edit their words so much where you don't understand them. Like I want it to be their voices. Seeing the variety in the interviews is amazing because some women and some people, period, their answers were very long and they're very detailed. And then there are some women like Shirley Davidson, my neighbor from the North, very abrupt and short worded. And I'd ask her like, yes, no, 12. Just kind of <laughs> answered her questions very short. Well, she got to the, she got to the book launch and she looked at the book and she goes, 
if I knew this was going to be a book, I would have answered my questions. <laughs> Just the best. But so these women sat there and I had gone through and it was my, literally it was going to be, it was my first kind of public speaking Um, experience in a situation like this I'm just fine but to put me on a stage in front of people I tell you it I was no 4-H'er so it was a learning curve for me and the nerves were unbelievable and I just want to sit behind a laptop and write books like I'm more comfortable doing that but I went up there and I told the story of my books and I told these women why I was so honored to tell their stories and how beautiful their contributions I felt were and not only just their families and their farms, but their entire community. And I referenced the shower that happened at this early hall. And I said, and I know for you guys, it was just another evening and another thing on your to-do list to strike off. But I said, you people, like you hold this community up. And women's eyes, and seeing their eyes glistening. And a lot of their husbands who are still there too, are putting their arm around their wife and stuff. And this woman had, Laura Lee, her, a daughter of one of the women came up to me after and she goes, I'm not going to let my mom hang out with you anymore because she's a crier now and she was never a crier before. <laughs> and I just laughed, but I saw that night them seeing sometimes maybe for the first time, like how much... <laughs> how much their work has meant and how how remarkable they truly were. And whether they knew it before or whether they didn't, I think they really saw it that night. And that meant a lot to me. And, and then having the media there, seeing the media there, I have this one picture of Gerard Lampow, a local journalist, and he was interviewing this lovely couple, June and Bob Stone, who are still friends of ours. Bob has now passed away, but June is still here and interviewing them. And I was like, oh, how lovely is that? These women are in the limelight and it was exactly where I felt they deserve to be. So yeah, it was very meaningful for me, for sure. Yeah. You've got me crying too. I, think <laughs> I love what you've said too, about really seeing something in them that, that you were missing from their life. And I think that sometimes that we can all get so complacent and just used to this is the way things are and this is what we do and not really seeing the the value that that every person brings to their community and like you said that these women are the backbone of their farms and of their community and their families and they just they don't think it's anything special but it is that's right it really is and just that stability too of them doing those jobs again and again year after year and that family growing accustomed to that and that family you recognize if and when god forbid these women pass away too right how many farms have almost ceased operating when the farm wife goes for any reason yeah it's just really remarkable to be around so many women and we all are right we're all around these women everywhere on any farm anywhere across the country right yeah i just love bringing these stories to life and if the family that I interviewed has that much more appreciation for that person at the end of the day. That's icing on the cake, right? So for sure. It's been great. So to lighten things up a little, can yes. you tell us about your children's book? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that so, won't make us cry. Yeah. No, this will be good. This will be good. So now you can see what my speeches are like. It's like half. so my children's book is called Bubbles Took a Trip. And it was really a tri- a, a book that happened upon us, to be honest. So we have this Birdie's mountain dog I told you about. Her name is Bubbles. And we had her since she was a puppy and she has been Katie too, to answer like the best dog that you could have with children and the best dog on a farm. Cause they're so loyal. She does not typically run away until this story happened, but so loyal. My daughter used to ride her and she's fine with it. And she's just the most beautiful dog. I love her to bits. And I'm sure my family will all be in counseling when something happens to her. But so when we renovated our house, we also, Arlene had to move out of the house. So we were actually out of here for eight months while we completed the renovation. And lucky for us, though, there was a mobile home, a trailer that had gone for rent just down the road. So we didn't have to go too far. But by the end of eight months, like we are itching to be back home. And we were getting close to the renovation being complete, but we weren't quite there yet. So our dog, we decided anyway, so it didn't make sense to move bubbles. So we had made it until literally the night before we moved back home. So our house was ready. 
Bubbles was here every day. Bubbles still got visits from dad and granddad when they came to the farm to work. So it was just lovely. But the day this story happened was literally the day before we moved. So my husband had come to the farm. He was working as per usual. And then I think it was around, it was the evening. He was leaving the farm to come back to our rental. So he was driving north on our range road and Bubbles, for whatever reason, decided, oh, hey, dad, where are you going? So she took off and started following Dean on his, in his truck. But Dean didn't really know or thought Bubbles would just turn back to come home. Bubbles made it all the way up to the highway. What happened then is the story that happened in this book. So we're going to now fast forward to the next morning. So the next morning happens and girls and I are getting up. We're getting ready to do the final packing in this trailer and move back home. And I get a text from my husband that says, mom, Bubbles is missing. Get on Facebook and put a post out. I was like, what? He goes, she's gone. She's not home. Like she's not here. You need to put a post out. And I was, my stomach instantly just fell to the floor. And I thought to myself, I cannot tell the girls. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I can't tell the girls. So I immediately put a post out, had a picture of bubbles, put it on Facebook. I said, bubbles is missing. Here's where we live. Dean did see in the rear view mirror bubbles following him. So he did know that she could have landed around the highway. So I put a post. I said, here's the highway where she was last seen. Has anyone seen her? So I just, oh, and then I got on the phone. I called SPCA. Of course, COVID hit at this point, right? This was literally the March that COVID was making everything fall apart. Called SPCA, only got the voicemail, left a message. I'm in tears. Surprise, surprise. I'm saying our Bernie's Mountain Dog is missing. You've got to help us. Has she been turned in? So a half an hour time span elapsed until I made the post to a post being sent to me and drawn my attention to. And they said, here's a picture for a woman. A woman had posted on another missing pets page for Lloyd Minster said found Bernie's mountain dog. So here's what happened. Dean leaves the farm. Bubbles follows her. She makes it up to the highway. Dean turns right to go home. Another woman and a semi are coming this way. So a semi comes and passes and there's a woman in a pickup truck behind the semi. The woman saw a semi go And then all of a sudden sees this beautiful Bernie's mountain dog. And she thinks to herself, oh my gosh, what is this dog doing up on the highway? She's going to get hit by something. So this woman pulls over right by my mailboxes. And of course, Bubbles, like any good guard dog she is, lays down on her back and proceeds to be rubbed by this woman. We always say she's so friendly. I wonder how many would-be robbers have pet her on our farm, right? Because she's not protecting us from anything. This woman sees Bubbles and pets her and Bubbles is just friendlier as all heck. And she's, I don't really know what to do here. I know that farm dogs wander or whatever, but she's, this is a highway and a semi just went by and I wouldn't be able to forgive myself if this dog get hit. So she, Bubbles jumps in her truck. She drives down to my neighbors, Darl and Shirley Davidson. And Shirley was in my first book. She was the short answered woman. And this woman had come to her door and she happened to have some tattoos, right? And some bigger earrings. And uh, she shows up at the door and she said, hi, I found this dog. Do you know who, the, who it belongs to? Darl and Shirley know we have a dog, but they don't know what our dog looks like. So they're like, no, nah, we don't know who it belongs to. Try up at this farm. So the woman gets back in the car and proceeds to drive to the next farm again, further from us. And she says she stopped there, but nobody was home. That was Billy and Diane Mouse and they weren't home. So she's sitting there and she's like, what in the heck do I do? So she gets to the phone and she calls her partner and she said, I found this dog. I don't know what to do. I know I shouldn't leave with the dog, but I don't know what to do. And I don't know how to find her owner. So this woman happened to work at an oil company in Lloyd. So she lives, lived near Red Deer at the time and she worked in Lloyd and so she works for a seven on seven off schedule. So she was on her way by my farm because she was going home for days off, but she knew she'd be back on the Sunday. So it was okay for her in her mind to take our dog home with her. And then online and find the owner. And then she knew she'd be back this way on the Sunday. 
She also happened to have had a kennel. I mean, it was kind of really, really, she took our dog on a holiday. This is what she did. While you guys were moving. (laughs) We were moving. She took her to the spa. So anyway, so this is what she did. So she took our dog. And, uh, and then once she got home, she put the post and this is overnight is what happened where people found the post. So a half an hour time elapsed. So I got the text from Dean found out De- bubbles was missing. And then a half an hour had gone by. So in that half an hour, I also got a text from my other neighbor, Dean Davidson. He belongs to Darl and Shirley. He goes, call mom. They said somebody came by with a dog in the back of their truck last night. So I called Darl and Shirley and I said, have you seen somebody with bubbles? Well, I hear Darl in the background. She was a woman. She had tattoos all over her body. And farmers, they're not always understanding of different people. So she had tattoos all over. I have got this picture in my head. My dog was taken by a gang. The bubbles is going into a dog fighting ring. I'm a mess. I'm like, oh my God. It turned out I ended up coming across the post where the woman found bubbles number phone number was posted i phoned her i found out she had my dog bubbles was happy everything worked out good so this book is that wild story from our perspective or from bubbles's perspective of what bubbles got to do on her adventure so she was at a kennel well clearly she got to play with a bunch of other dogs it was just hilarious it was a story that happened upon us it turned out i never had a vision to write kids books But as I said, I had done this little, it was called the tiny book course. And it said, if you did want to self-publish a book, pick a small project. I thought this is a small project, something that I could do from start to finish. And it couldn't have turned out better, honestly. It's just such a funny story. And I did all the graphics myself and included pictures of bubbles and other graphics I found. And oh, it was just the best. Yep. So it's a children's book and we have more ideas coming down the pipe. So it'll be lots of fun. That is fun. Does Bubbles know that she's famous? I think she has an inkling, but um, yeah. she does have an inkling. I think she knows there's something special about her for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like the upside of dogs like that too, though, is that any would-be robber would hopefully feel so guilty. Although I've been told that my line of logic is not perfect here. When I I, I actually met my husband online and when we went on our first date, on a blind date, I brought my dog along. And he said, what did you, like, why did you bring the dog along? He asked me this, like, last year, like, eight years we've been married. And he finally asked, I said, I figured you might axe murder me, but only a real monster would axe murder somebody in front of their dog. And he's like, don't know that I really understand that. I was like, oh, made sense to me. And obviously it worked (laughs) out okay. And he said, if the dog hadn't liked me, would there have been a second date? I said, no, there wouldn't have been a rest of the first date. If my dog hadn't taken to him would have been the end of it there's no way yeah oh that's awesome that is a good judge of people yeah so sure our motivation for starting the podcast was to connect with other parents who are doing this raising their kids on the land what have some of your parenting challenges been when it comes to farm life in particular yeah hearing me talk and then and reading the books it is as magical it is awesome it is i love it i love all of the things that they learn at Uh, what I feel is to be a much younger age than their urban counterparts. My eight-year-old can tell you exactly where her state comes from and like what part of the cow and what part of the steer. And yeah, I think that there are so many benefits, but if there were our negatives for me, it's I did live in, in the city for so long prior to moving my husband moving in with my husband, I did feel like truly that I was going to be a city person for life. I loved traveling. I traveled anywhere by myself. I would book my two weeks vacation off from the government and I would just take a trip across the country because I hadn't seen Nova Scotia yet. Like it was my goal to see every province by the time I was 30 and I made that happen. Traveling was always very big to me, eating different foods, all of that kind of stuff. So if there is a negative, it would be, I do get concerned sometimes that children only see a very sort of homogenous way of life. They only see, yeah, a very homogenous way of life and a very homogenous, say, culture and class of people. I worry sometimes that they're not seeing the variety that cities can provide them with on an everyday basis. And so because of that, I work extremely hard 
in broadening their horizons in terms of books we read, talks that we have, and quite frankly, just taking them places. I'm going to tell a story that when I think my daughter was just, she couldn't even have been three. I had Madeline in the grocery store when she was younger. She's 10 now. And I have a very good friend that I went to university with in Southern California. So we go visit her probably every few years or whatever. And one of my favorite places to go when I go visit her is Venice Beach, California, because you go there and it's this such a cool place where you walk down the, the boardwalk along the water and there's like an outdoor gym and you see a bunch of guys sitting there working out and then you see a group of people rapping and then you see a group of people roller skating and then you see just every different kind of person, every different kind of music, every different kind of thing. And so I was in the grocery store with Madeline one day. And uh, there was a woman of African descent in the cooler aisle and she was, and for some reason, kids are young, just people will catch their eye and they'll just stare. And I noticed I had Madeline in the front of my cart and I noticed it her, noticed her at that moment, just staring at that woman. And I thought to myself, I wonder what you're thinking right now. I don't know what she's thinking, but I was curious. And anyway, and I just thought to myself, I was like, I bet you that was the first non-white person that my daughter had seen in quite frankly, a very long time. And I was like, and that was another one of those moments that really stuck with me where I was like, okay, I really need to watch that. Right. And make sure. So I literally, I came home and I phoned one of my best friends, Lan. I said, we're coming down to California and we need to take my kid to Venice beach because I needed to make sure she saw. So that would be one kind of a worry. But I think that there are ways to work around that, right? I make sure traveling is a huge thing on my list of priorities for our family. I want my kids to experience other cultures and ways of life and all of that kind of thing. But I think the benefits outweigh the negative, any negative aspects of living rurally for sure. Yeah. I know I've told my husband that it's really important to me that we travel to more cities as the kids get older because... A, they never learn to drive on interstates. Our nearest oh, yeah. interstate is an hour and a half away. Like, they need that practice. It's not safe for them to yeah. not be able to drive on the interstate. And also yeah. just things like reading a bus schedule. These things that living in rural Iowa, they're not going to learn how to read a subway map, but they need to because yes. that's part of how you be safe if you ever exist in places in the world. And that's you know, we sometimes joke about bringing our country mice to the city. Like you go to a shopping mall and they see an escalator. <laughs> this is the highlight of the trip. We're only about an hour from Ottawa. So there's lots of museums and stuff, but yeah, yeah. you go to the museum and they spend half the day going up and down the escalator. <laughs> it's like, how are some of the displays? <laughs> It's totally true. I've done but there's that an escalator too. and an elevator. Woo. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is absolutely true. There's going back to my farm kids book. There's another aspect of those interviews that, or of kids that is so endearing. And it's, yeah, the farm is their whole world and they would have it no other way. One of the little boys from Nova Scotia, Charlie and Benny, the brothers, that I had interviewed one of them. I can't remember which one, but one of them had made the comment because I'd asked them, what do you think it would be like if you lived in the city? Or what do you think? So just getting that perspective from them. And I forget exactly how he put it, but it was something along the lines of, oh no, it would be awful. There aren't nearly enough farms in the city. <laughs> exactly. There aren't yeah. enough farms there. That's the main problem, really. Oh, it was adorable. So as a photographer, do you have any tips for parents who are trying to capture those memories with while their kids are little or to document life on a far, on the farm and, and really savor those moments and capture them? For me, honestly, it's just take that damn picture kind of thing. Something, I, and I know you can't always have, iPhones take amazing photos nowadays. They really do. I have a 40 inch by 60 inch canvas in my living room of my daughters when they were super young and Dean was just out through the trees of our yard seeding his last field that year you know it's seeding time or planting dad's gone for a long time kids miss them dreadfully right they were young my daughter one daughter was in these bright red rubber boots and my other daughter was in a sundress and they were just standing there and it was a photo I had the mindset to take at the very last minute I conveniently had my phone in my hand I went down and I snapped this picture of Madeline running to her dad 
and Katie's standing there in a sundress and Dean in the cedar in the background and he's crouched behind the cedar unplugging something. And I got it. It was from an iPhone and I got it blown up to 40 by 60 inches. And I tell you, it's absolutely beautiful. And it's just that Dean told me something. I remember when I first got here too, he said, we have no photos of the farm hardly until you came around and it's just and like his mother often said she goes I was just too busy you're running with the kids you're exhausted you're trying to keep up to everything and her especially she had four boys and was a very traditional farm wife still is and so she really didn't have the time right so if my advice is just don't worry about the aperture and the setting and just take the picture because even my kids now, they love, do they bug me for taking too many pictures? Absolutely. But do they love looking back at these albums and seeing their life growing up stage by stage or funny little videos I took or daddy's old tractor or different things like that? Just take the picture. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then, you know, more than taking them and letting them get lost on your electronic drive for years and years sit back some evening and look at the pictures too because I think it's something I love doing like whether I'm looking for pictures for my books or looking for pictures for my website or whatever there's something about sitting in front of your laptop in the evening with a glass of wine and just appreciating this life that we live and for me it's photos like I said I see my life in photos I see life in photos sitting there and looking at those pictures will really, I think, help you appreciate this amazing life that we do get to. (laughs) I know my my daughter is really obsessed right now with going through my phone at bedtime and looking for baby pictures of her and her brother. She'll say things about, oh, I was so little then. And I'm like, honey, that was last year. (laughs) Okay, though, with digital photos, especially, you can just delete them. Like you can take 50 shots and get one or two good ones and delete the rest of them. It's not, it's not costing you anything. You're not wasting film or having to wait a week to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, We are so lucky compared to previous generations where a photo was a, you were making a commitment to, plus you had to actually get the camera out where now we don't really need to worry about those things, but yeah, it is the, the also making sure they're accessible and that people can actually see them and that we don't just take them and forget about them completely. For sure. Yeah. All right. So we ask all of our guests, if you were going to dominate a category at a county fair and it can be real or made up, what category would it be? That's hilarious. At a county fair. My pickles. My pickles. What kind? I am told my dilled pickles. Okay. I am told by my family, and that counts, that I have the best pickles on the planet. So I had never made pickles before I came here. So again, I mentioned like my life was a little less traditional, right? And so we didn't have big family recipe traditions or anything like that, quite frankly, or too many of them anyway. But uh, pickles, when I came here, I've always loved pickles. And actually, that's a lie. One thing I will say, so a big part of my life, I was raised by a Polish stepfather who to this day is an incredibly pivotal part of me and my sister's life. So he met my mother, he met us when I was probably about four, actually three and a half, four. And he's, like I said, he's still in my life. He and my mother are no longer married. He raised me and my sister. So we're all very close. He was a Polish immigrant. He came here in 1975 because we always say we've been in Canada the same amount of time. Same year I was born. And he uh, is the Eastern European, like when it comes to food, when it comes. So he always loved pickles. So pickles was always a big thing in our life. So I've loved them ever since I was a child. So anyway, when I came here, I started learning some different things from my mother-in-law and stuff like that in the kitchen. And she wanted help with making pies or making pickles or whatever. So I go over there and help her. And I said, okay, I got to watch you making pickles because I need to start making some, right? I'd like to try them myself. So anyway, my mother-in-law always makes them with a lot of the bigger ones as well, right? But me and my hubby, whenever we'd bring a jar home, he goes, if we could just have them all when they're really, really nice and small and nice and crisp, that would be the best. That would be the best. So Over the years, I've just commended the recipe to the exact number of garlic and all of these kinds of things. And I really do think I am 
I make the best pickles. And it's also gotten to the point where a lot of our city friends have come to know that they really like my pickles. And so they come here and they beg for a jar. I've got two little elementary school friends of my daughter's that love my pickles so much, we give them to them for their birthday. So I think I would dominate the pickle category. That, that sounds like pretty good reviews. I well, would say that a ribbon is definitely forthcoming. In our, six-year-old uh, kids, come on. They know yeah, everything. for sure. <laughs> hey, Lee, is, so this this rec- oh, is this recipe secret or is it something that we could share? It's fine yeah. if it's secret. That's fine. I'm going to have to think on that. I'll right. think on that. Yeah, right. it's okay. okay. You're, you're allowed Fair to keep enough. it. If you're going to yeah. win... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Don't want to let these things out. Yeah. So we're going to move into the cussing and discussing segment of the show. We've registered for an online platform called SpeakPipe, where you can leave your cussing and discussing entries for us, and we can play them on the show. So go to www.speakpipe.com backslash barnyard language and leave us a voice memo. Or you can always send us an email at barnyardlanguage at gmail.com and we can read it out for you. So Katie, what are you going to discuss and discuss this week? I just want to know why little kids are so fucking weird, Arlene. That's it. (laughs) I was getting ready for bed last night because, of course, both kids are still sleeping in our bed, especially when daddy's out in the tractor. And I was changing into my jammies and a girl child looks over at me and she goes, Mommy, you look like an ice cream cone. And then she climbed in bed and fell asleep. I just... What am I supposed to do with that? Like... (laughs) where do they come up with this shit i don't know i I don't know so that's what i have this week billy what do you have to cuss and discuss okay why the hell do farm husbands hate chicken so much so let me explain so my husband would eat beef like there have been days where he will come home and make a minute steak for lunch for himself when I've already got like rib steak for supper that night, I love steak too. I love rib roast, all of that, but we can't yeah, support have the it. industry and all that. Right? Stuff. Yes. We cannot have it five times a week. So I buy these chicken breasts from co-op and I buy them pre-marinated and just, I cook them so delightfully that they're so moist and so delicious. We got to support the other farmers too, in my opinion. Yes, for sure. No matter how well I cook it and how beautiful of a salad I put on the side of it at night or whatever, the kids have come to grading my meal. They think this is hilarious. They bring home homework and they got a P for proficient or they got an A for adequate or they got an E for excellent. This is what they give me for my meals now. Little buggers, right? I'm like their personal chef and they grade me on my meal. But anyway, I let them do it. It's hilarious. No matter how good the chicken is, It's only an A for adequate. And I was like, Dean, you complain so much that you just want beef all the time. But now the girls think they they're sure they hate chicken, even though there's nothing wrong with the chicken. The chicken is bloody delicious, but they, yeah. So it's like, why do farmers have such an aversion to anything other than beef? I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So Billy, here's one for you too. In our house, if something is good, we'll say, oh no, it's terrible. It's disgusting. I will take it and get rid of it so that nobody else has to eat it. I accidentally did this to a coworker last week with (laughs) an amazing meal that he cooked for me. And he said, how is it? And I said, oh God, it's horrible. I'll get rid of it for you. (laughs) And the look on his face. And then, so of course I'm telling him about this. And then I was reminded of the time that my husband said this to me in front of guests that we had over for dinner who also did not know who do, don't know your fucking with your me reverse language when he said something about he was just going on about how horrible the meal was and they were just staring i really didn't think she'd put up with this but okay. and i'm like <laughs> and why you know, is trust he doing me, it in when, front of company <laughs> when he actually doesn't like the meal he won't say anything which doesn't really make any sense because then i'm like we must have liked it he didn't say anything and then like years later he'll be like i don't really like that i'm like but yeah, if you go on about how horrible it is, it's because you like it. Got it. It's hard to remember not to bring those things out in public though. So Arlene, what do you have to cuss and discuss this week? So mine this week is, I guess I'm cussing myself. So the small town that we live near, a couple of years ago, they did a big construction project on part of the main street. So it was like everything from way underground, like they were replacing water mains and natural gas pipelines and all that kind of stuff. So 
that section was done and now they're doing the other part of the main street so this is the town i have to drive through when i go anywhere really other than to, if i were to pick the kids up from school it's in the opposite direction but for the most part if i'm going somewhere i'm going through this town and i keep forgetting that there's a major detour until i get down there and then i'm like yeah the main street's still closed and it's gonna be closed for months and it has already been closed for a month at this point and i could go there's many alternate routes but i have to like physically see the no entry sign and then i'm like oh yeah 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 i can't take this street because <laughs> It's still closed. Oh, oh. So that's just cussing myself for not remembering that there's going to be construction. Probably about the time that I remember that the construction is there will be like in October when they're finally done. And when they're finished. It's all yeah. fixed. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, Billy, for joining us on the podcast today. Remind people where they can find more out about you, about your books. Where should oh, they look you up online? Yes, I appreciate it so much. My name is Billy, B-I-L-I-J Miller. And it's that same website, billyjmiller.com. But I highly encourage, pop on there, you can click shop and you can order the books directly from my home supply. And that will get you signed copies if you want to give them for a gift or anything else. Or you could find any of my books on Amazon, on chapters online as well chapters indigo or you could honestly just go into your local bookstore if you want to shop local which i highly encourage as well they can order them in too so just ask them to search up my name and but definitely visit my website billyjmiller.com and you'll find all about me there perfect thank you so much it was great to meet you oh thank you I should get back to the script. Thank you everyone for joining us today on Barnyard Language, a proud member of the Positively Farming Media Podcast Network. That's a mouthful, Arlene. Wow. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as Barnyard Language. And on Twitter, we generally avoid it. But if we are there, it's on Barnyard Pod. If you want to connect with other farm families, join our private Barnyard Language Facebook group. Patreon is a service where you commit to making a small monthly donation, which goes towards the making of this podcast. We would love it if you would become a patron. Go to www.patreon.com backslash barnyard language to support the show. Another way to support us is to rate and review the podcast on Apple or Spotify and follow the show so that you never miss an episode. We're always in search of future guests for the podcast. If you or someone you know would like to chat with us, please get in touch. Arlene, I have a, an extra family photography tip. Clean your windows. I always try to take pictures out the window and they end up with all these horrible spots. I cleaned my office windows this week for the first time in the eight years I've lived here and God knows how long before that. <laughs> yeah. And, and it now took, you can take clear pictures? It took an entire roll of paper towels to wash three windows. <sighs> yeah. But now I can see out. So that's Aww. nice. I had no idea how bad they were. So there's my extra tip. And now I'm going to stop recording. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today on Barnyard Language. If you enjoy the show, we encourage you to support us by becoming a patron. Go to www.patreon.com backslash Barnyard Language to make a small monthly donation to help cover the costs of making the show. Please rate and review the podcast and follow the show so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as Barnyard Language, and on Twitter, we are Barnyard Pod. If you'd like to connect with other farming families, you can join our private Barnyard Language Facebook group. We're always in search of future guests for the podcast. If you or someone you know would like to chat with us, get in touch. We are a proud member of the Positively Farming Media Podcast Network.